I read the, I mean, based on it, right, all the, sil- the, the, the caps of silicone, they actually said that because you use more material, it actually might be a disadvantage for swimmers. That's the thing. <laughs> like, we just wanted people to have the option. Yeah. You see what I'm saying? Yeah. We weren't saying that, yo, like, everyone's going to go and buy a sole cap and use that at the Olympics. Right. That wasn't what we were saying. But what we, what we were saying is actually we wanted people, if you're a competitive swimmer, we wanted you to have the option. My graduates from my school being Forbes, bag drop. Bag drop. <laughs> a mic drop. Bag drop. Bag drop. All right, guys, welcome back. EYL UK yeah. Division. Um, this has been a great, great run in the United Kingdom, London, Europe. We went, we went to France. Um, so, A, first and foremost, shout out to everybody in London. Yeah. Shout out to everybody that came to our event. Um, sorry for anybody that didn't get in the event. Yeah, yeah. Um, but we are coming back and we're going to do something way, way bigger. That's a fact. To accommodate everybody a, a much more suitable situation. Uh, but this episode is going to be a dope one. First of all, shout out to my guy Jack Jones, um, who we actually talked to a few days ago, and who I've connected with years ago. Yeah, and uh, solid dude, super good dude. Yeah, super good sharp. Dude. Yeah. yeah. So he referred me to one of his good friends, um, Tox Ahmed Salah Salahuddin, um, who I said it correctly. Yeah, yeah, you said it good. Who um, actually is a very, very interesting story. So he's an entrepreneur. From London, from Nigeria originally, but Legos. grew up in London, <laughs> yeah. um, and it's a it's a very interesting niche business where they do swim caps. So it's called Soul Cap. Mm-hmm. So how it really got a lot of attention on like a, a global scale is that I believe it was banned from the Olympics, right? So we'll talk about this whole thing, but it's a very interesting um, concept and idea where. It's not just for women, though, right? No, but no, it's it, not. It's, but that's like where it became. That like, was kind of that yeah, was a narrative on it, right? Exactly. So, like, black. Well, you could speak about it better. Yeah. No, I, I think it's dope. Like, because we've obviously highlighted a lot of black brands. Yeah. And when I heard your story, it reminded me of the Eastside Golf story, mm. where there was a sport that blacks were kind of excluded from. Yeah. Right. And swimming is one of those sports as well. Yeah. Like, yeah. I, I think Rowers reported that out of the seventy-three thousand registered swimmers. Competitive swimmers, like 650 are black. It's crazy. And so it's like this is not something that we're doing. And a lot of the reasons, especially with, with our women, is they're here. Yeah, definitely. And so like you guys come into a space and it's like, okay, let's make this an inclusive thing. So I think it's going it's to be an interesting topic. It's going to be a great episode for sure. Yeah, it's a, it's a swim cap that's made for, you know. Yeah. Everybody, but like for black women's hair, yeah, afros, weaves, uh, dreadlocks, braids, extensions, and that's not something that like a regular swim cap can't really um, accommodate that situation of yeah. So it's one of these things where it is a very niche product, but it's widely used. Yeah, it's like something that you don't really think about too much, but if you go swimming, you know, you wear swim caps, especially on a competitive level. It, and absolutely, especially women, especially black women. Yeah, um, who don't want to get their hair wet. So, um, black-owned business out of London. Very interesting conversation I'm sure we're going to have. So, first and foremost, thank you for joining us. Appreciate it. Thank you for having me, guys. Appreciate that. Nah, for sure. So, all right. Let's get this going. How do you... Because you actually come from an uh, actuary background, right? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Are you, an actuary. Are you still doing that now? I'm still doing it. I'm still an actuary. I still got my, my oh, nine to five. Lloyd's yeah. of London? Uh, Lloyd's of London Syndicate, yeah. So, Lloyd's of London, one of, probably the biggest insurance company mm-hmm. as far as... Insurance, not how we look at it in America. Like they insure, like artwork. They insure pretty much everything. Like a lot of like uh, even football players in America in college, they got like Lloyd's of London, like disability mm-hmm. policies. Like anything that you can really think of, Lloyd's of London insures yeah. it. One of the largest insurance companies in the world. So I think Zion Williamson had that after he had sprained his uh, his foot at Duke. He had, okay. a, had an insurance policy in the Lloyd's on. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. So, but you're an actuary. But yeah, yeah, exactly. So I'm a, I'm a qualified actuary. I'm so a fellow. I know what an actuary is, but can you explain to the people who might not know what an actuary yeah. is? Um, essentially, um, you know, the day job, what it is, is that um, I use like maths and statistics to try and calculate risk, essentially. So if I can work out what, how much, if I can price a risk or I can work out how much I think, you know, uh, a particular policy might cost us. And then I can work out essentially how much we need to charge 
so we can like make profit essentially pay all the bills expenses and that kind of stuff um and then also the other side of it is how much money you need to hold in reserve as as an insurance company in case things go wrong so um yeah, yeah. high level yeah it's the, it's the math side of it and that's something that a lot of times people don't understand how insurance is priced mm. but when you look at the actuary like let's take life insurance they'll look at how many people die in a particular year yeah. Um, how long people live, how many people get a policy, and they all and it's all one big math equation. And then they can say, okay, for a hundred thousand dollar policy for a preferred rate, it's going to cost one hundred fifty dollars. Exactly. It's not just a random number that's thrown out there. It's actually done through actual yeah actuarial yeah, yeah actuarial yeah, math yeah. equation. So you you must be a uh, very <laughs> very smart guy. Brilliant when young to, man. When it comes to the math work. Ah, uh, nah, man. Algebra. Man. You passed algebra. I, yeah, know, I, I never. I never passed algebra. <laughs> I mean, yeah, you, could, you could if you wanted to. <laughs> <laughs> you could definitely. Um, all right. So you. So that's your day job. Yeah. But when you decide to become an entrepreneur. Um. So to be honest with you, like me and my business partner Michael, like even from young, we've always been kind of on the business thing, always trying to like you know make little hustles and stuff like that. And I think. You know, I was working in the city um, and I just felt like, you know, I was, I think, about 26, 27 at the time. And we were like, I oh, know, we need to get this side hustle popping. Like, we need to do something. We spoke about it, you know, um, around the time we were sort of dabbling in a bit of crypto, all that kind of stuff. And we were like, let's make, let's make a more sort of conscious effort, to, effort to, to start a business. But nothing really popped to us. Nothing really kind of, you know, came to us. Uh, that we thought, okay, cool, we could do this. And this is credible. It's not overly competitive, but there's a big enough market and all that kind of stuff. Um, and then sort of, you know, we, we both grew up not knowing how to swim, essentially. Yeah. And I don't know if the same goes for you guys, whether, whether you can swim. Well, yeah, or, let's talk about yeah. that a little bit because, um, so you're from Nigeria originally. Yeah. Lagos, right? Yeah. Shout out to Lagos. <laughs> um, Shout out. So I'm not sure how it is on the continent of Africa, but in America, it's a very weird dynamic where a lot of majority of black people don't know how to swim. Yeah. And it's become like a whole stigma of black people don't swim. Like you'll see like <laughs> these memes where it's like a white pool party and like everybody's in the water. <laughs> a black pool party, nobody's in the water, everybody got jean shorts on. Like they're not even thinking about going in the pool. Yeah. So. It's interesting that you start a swim company because a lot of black people can't swim. Yeah. You can't swim. We, no, they you couldn't. Kinda, you we couldn't, couldn't swim. Couldn't. As adults, you became that's swimmers. It. That was it. So, so for us, it, that's how it kind of, it, it kind of went, it was a bit magical in ways, the way it happened. So like me and Michael grew up not knowing how to swim, right? Uh, my mom can't swim. Michael's mom can't swim. Um, I grew up with two older sisters. They can swim, but they didn't really because of the hair issues and all that kind of stuff. So, um, you know, we, we were like, 26, 27, we were like, you know, we, we should learn how to swim. You know, it's, it's limiting. You <laughs> just know. in case. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, yeah. Even, even, you know, not even the, the necessary just the drown prevention side, but at them times we were thinking, you know, you go on holiday, people are all like, you know, jumping into yeah, yeah, cenotes yeah. and stuff. And off you, boat, yeah, 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 off the boat, all that. <laughs> and, and, and we couldn't do it, you know, and we were like, no, nah, we, should, we should actually learn how to swim. So obviously looked into it, got some adult swimming lessons. So y'all decided and to take class together? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So we took, we took classes. That's real friendship, man. Yeah. Well, well, yeah. Well, if I said that, you, you'd be up for it? I, I mean, we know, can I swim. Know, I mean, we can swim, but I'm yeah. saying. Yeah. I mean, there's, the thing is, there's, a, there's lots out there. Yeah. And, you know, we, didn't, we just didn't really look for it. But again, like you say, it was, the, it, was, it was the feeling that swimming wasn't for black people, really. Yeah. You know, black people don't really swim. Like, you, got, like, you know, when I was... Uh, you know, I was taught in school, essentially. We did school lessons, but I wasn't that good. And the teacher didn't really pay any attention. And if you couldn't, yeah. they kind of just sort of said, oh, okay, cool, like, it's forget like them guys <laughs> and pay a bit more attention to the people who were good. Um, so I did lessons, just never really took, took on to it. And I think because my family didn't encourage it, I didn't do it. Whereas maybe another family might have encouraged it more, you know. Um, so anyway, we did these adult lessons. There was a woman in the, in the swimming class and she didn't have like a particularly big afro. She had just like a small kind of like, you know, afro classic, you know, hairstyle. And her swimming cap was just coming off all the time, literally. Her hair was soaked, like, you know, and we had weekly lessons and she would say, it's obviously a faff, it's effort. She's got to go, she's got to wash her hair, mm -hmm. the chlorine, it's damaging. Because she wanted to learn to swim, you know, she was willing to make that sacrifice. Um, and then I think that was when it sort of clicked to us, like, hang on a minute, how come you don't get swimming caps that are come in different sizes for different, 
different hair types, you know. Um, when you often buy a swimming cap, you'll see it says one size fits all yeah. in the packaging, um, which isn't the case. Uh, so we, we looked into it and, and we were like, no, nah, there's nothing really out there. Like, that's, like, there's definitely nothing out there credible. And, and this could be an opportunity. And because we were both on trying to hustle and trying to find, you know, little side things, we were like, why not? Let's give it a go. Yeah, I, I've been through that, man. Like, my daughter was in swimming. And it was always the one size fits all. Yeah. And by the time she swam twice, either the cap would rip because I, I would, we would try to make sure her hair wouldn't get wet or it would be the opposite. We put the cap on and her hair still got wet yeah. just because it, it didn't fit. Yeah, like, yeah, it didn't yeah, matter yeah. if I braided her hair or if she had her hair natural. But like you said, yeah. one of those reasons why we don't get in the pool, or well, black women for sure, is that the damage that it does yeah. to their hair. So let's talk about, I wanna, I'm going to ask you all the business questions, but for people that might not be fully educated, what is the issue with black women going swimming? Is it the chlorine that messes up their hair? What, what is the, what's the whole problem with that? I mean, I think definitely that's a barrier. Like, that's something that, uh, you know, discourages black women, I, I believe. Because they get their hair done. I think they get their hair done and then they're thinking, if I, need to, if I want to go swim, my hair's going to get wet and then it's going to ruin my hair. You know? When you say Plus, ruin it, what, what, does that, what does that mean? Like, it, it ruins it if it's straight, Right. Well, I think if it's I, an afro, it's not going to get wrong. Right? But the chlorine, the chlorine dries it. it. Yeah, the it chlorine it too. Has, has damaging effects yeah. um, on, on the hair. So there's that, there's that issue as well. And I think also, to be honest with you, us as black people, you know, you go swimming and you come out and your skin's all dry. And do you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. And all them kind of things. So I, I feel like, you know, the, there's a few different layers to it. But, but we, we definitely saw that the swimming caps was at least one of these barriers to entry for mm-hmm. people. Um, and, you know... I think when we when we first started the business, you know, we kind of just took a punt. We spoke to our moms, sisters, friends, and we were like, you know, would you, if you had a swimming cap that fit your hair, would you potentially go swimming? And they were like, yeah, you know, actually that is definitely one of the top reasons. It's not the only reason, but right, it's one right, of the right. top reasons why why we wouldn't go. Um, and we took a punt. And to be honest with you, like our first order, uh, we, we always referred to it. We, we ordered 150 black XL caps and 50 burgundy, right? And I'll get into sort of the colours and stuff in a bit, but um, they just started selling. And it was the reviews and it was the feedback we were getting from the customers that really reaffirmed the fact that actually, like, this is, we've got something here, like, yeah. we onto something. So when you ordered that, these are the prototypes, obviously. You're, you're just looking at it like, all right, well, that one size fit all is not going to work. We'll get an XL. Or were you looking at actual texture, like, all right, those are made out of silicone, silicone, we need to make silicone. Like, what was that process like? Oh, yeah, exactly. So, so, um, you know, if I take a step back, the initial process was, you know, we were looking at the different sizes that were out there. Yeah. We were trying to research, okay, cool. If we were to make, to, to launch a bigger cap, what kind of size would be a good size, you know? And we had to play around a lot, like did some testing with, with our sisters and staff, um, looking at the materials, you know, okay, you get latex swimming caps. Like it right, goes right, deep, right, you get right. latex swimming caps, you can get neoprene swimming caps. And, you know, okay, keeping your hair dry was one of the key things. So neoprene was out of the picture. But latex, we found uh, from the research was showing people can get like allergic reactions to it. Like people, you know, could have issues. So silicone just outstandingly seemed like the best material to, to go for. Mm-hmm. Um, non-toxic, you know, people don't have allergic reactions to it and stuff. So um, so we, we, we went for silicone and yeah, and that was, that was kind of like the early process. Yeah. Um, had a few prototypes, a bunch of different samples and we just tested and we thought, okay, that one size that we that we initially started with we thought that hopefully will work yeah. for kind of like the early the early you know phase and most of the industry is made in silicone right yeah yeah yeah, yeah so yeah. it was like Dominantly. you didn't have to reinvent the wheel no no said, exactly okay, let's they're using that that's it we're gonna use that but we're gonna make our own interpretation or we're yeah. gonna change the sizes of it exactly okay. exactly that was it um and you know it's funny like when we first started we didn't really have money me and michael we started with two thousand pounds it's two thousand pounds to start a business a thousand pounds each at the time, obviously, it was, it was a lot of money, but we were kind of like, we'll take the risk, we'll take it here. If it, if it doesn't work out, then, you know, kind of so be it. Um, and, yeah, we managed to order these 150 black caps and these 50 burgundy. Um, yeah. And, yeah, literally the reviews and the, 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 the ratings we were getting from women who were like, oh, I wish I had this when I was growing up. If I had this, I would have you know, swum, I'm buying one for my kids, like, so on and so forth. And then that was like, okay, cool, no, we need to keep pushing, we need to keep going, keep reinventing. Uh, yeah, re- reinvesting, reinventing. Um, and then from there, obviously now we've got like a, diff- a, a broader range. So we've got like XL, double XL, medium and large. 
And we've also sell regular size swimming caps as well. Because so you were doing a nine to five, right? Yeah. Michael's also doing nine to five. So Mike, Michael's actually studying um, and he was working whilst also studying. So he was finishing university at the time. Okay. But he was also working at a bank. Yeah. So you sold over 100,000 swim caps today, right? Yeah. So, all right, so you start with 2,000 pounds um, and that gets you, how much, 150? 150 uh, black and 50 uh uh, burgundy. burgundy. So, so two hundred, two hundred caps. caps. Yeah, to start. Yeah. Um, so what? All right. What exactly is the process? You got you had those made from scratch. Yes. Yeah, so you reached out to uh, factories, uh, a, ma- a manufacturer yeah. and said, "Look, we want swim caps, but bigger." Yeah. Is there any difference other than it just being bigger? Uh, no, not not it really. To be honest with you, the opening, so the size of the opening, and also it's like when we're talking about bigger, the proportions are different from depending on a which, normal which size cap. Yeah. yeah. So, like for example, like the opening. You can make the opening smaller or bigger. You can get the, the kind of size or the volume of the cap as well okay. um, bigger. So uh-huh. those were kind of like the two main parameters we had to play with. So it's like a, like a mushroom. <laughs> yeah, 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 kind of. So, all right. So you get that. You get the inventory in. What's the next step? How do you decide the price? How do you sell the first 200? <laughs> so for us, really, what we, what we did, we kind of... Our, our initial strategy really was actually we started out as like a FBA, uh, Amazon FBA type, type uh, approach. Can you tell them if they don't know what that is? Yeah. So basically what we do, we get the caps, we, you know, we find a manufacturer that we're happy with. We brand it, you know, so obviously Soul Cap was a brand. We registered, you know, the company, trademarked, all that kind of stuff. Michael designed the packaging um, and, you know, we're li- liaising with our factory in China. They basically make the products, they put it all together like... And then we can get them to send it to us and then we can send it into Amazon fulfillment centers. And then when we get orders, basically Amazon ship those, um, those, those, those products to the customer. You know, um, because that's interesting because we did an episode on Amazon selling probably two years ago. What's going on, Ernest? Look, at 26, I made one of the most important decisions of my life. That's right. I didn't have family at the time, but I did have a life insurance policy. A wise man told me life insurance isn't about the people who die. It's about the people who live. It's one of the best ways to secure generational wealth for your family's future. And it makes perfect sense why people get life insurance, especially term coverage, which surprisingly is affordable. Why not pay a little bit each month to secure the future of the people you love long term? If you're asking yourself that question, I want you to check out Ladder. Ladder makes it impressively fast and easy to get coverage. You just need a few minutes and a phone or a laptop to apply. Ladder's algorithms work instantly, so you'll know right away if you're approved for coverage. No hidden fees, and you can cancel any time. And since life insurance costs more as you age, now is the time to get started. So check out Ladder today to see if you're instantly approved. Go to ladderlife.com slash E-Y-L. That's L-A-D-D-E-R life.com slash E-Y-L. That's ladderlife.com slash E-Y-L. You know how this works. Don't wait. Don't hesitate. Secure your family's future right now. So what he was saying is obviously yours is, you know, labeled, but he was saying there's a lot of products that you can sell on Amazon where you can white label. And he was like nail clippers, nail filers. Stuff, nobody really ever cares who actually makes those, yeah. right? You just go. And I'm thinking swim caps is kind of similar. Like you have a niche thing where it's made for sick births, but yeah. Amazon would be a good place to sell that. Yeah, yeah. Because you're literally just going online, typing in swim cap. Yeah. You're yeah, not necessarily just trying to buy like a specific brand. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So you're yeah. not, there's not really a lot of like competition in the space. That was it. I think for us as well, we, we, we knew that early on, like trying to acquire customers for our own kind of retail website would probably be too expensive. You know, trying to go hard with the Google ads. With and, the marketing. And, and yeah, and the Facebook ads and the marketing, that kind of stuff. And we felt like, okay, cool. If um, if we if we can go, go through Amazon, people who are looking for a large swimming cap or a swimming cap for dreadlocks or a swimming cap for, you know, braids or, or long hair and those kind of keywords, that hopefully they would come across our product and they would make that purchase. So what was the... All right. So you... When you, you put it on Amazon, but you put keywords in there or in the description, how did you separate your product from the other swim caps? Yeah, that was it, really. I mean, the, the product description, um, like I said, early on, you know, when we, when we sort of first, first started, we didn't even have pictures uh, of you know, models using them. So when we first, first started, we got the caps, we sent them in, we had the packaging, cool. And we were like, OK, we need product pictures. You know, we ain't really got a big budget to get, you know, some, some, some big 
you know, photo shoots go in. So we sent them off to a product photographer, came back. Okay, what went great? Okay, do you know what? We think we need to invest the money and 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 put some, uh, you know, try and try and get some models together and stuff. So it was our very first photo shoot. It was you know, it was an interesting experience. But we got some models who we thought, okay, this is someone with big hair, you know, voluminous. We no one on Amazon was using black models at that time yeah. in that category. No yeah. one. So we were like, cool, like. We want to actually get some black models, get some women who like you know have long hair. We had me- we had men as well in, in that very first photo shoot who had yeah. like dreads and stuff. Um, and and we just any any money we were getting in from sales, even the little bit we were getting in, we were reinvesting back. Do you get me? Gotcha. So we were so we we're making sure like the photo shoot cool. Like let's try and get a proper photographer. Let's try and get a proper like little studio unit. We had like a little container in um in Box Park. It was literally a container unit. Um, got a few models and stuff, and we just got some shots and. You know, a lot of I, I was like the person who kind of tried to, you know, creative direct it. It wasn't great, <laughs> but we got we got a few shots in there. And to be honest with you, when we actually then had modeled pictures, that was when the sales really started coming consistent. So you, the name Soul Cab, I mean, it, it speaks to a, a specific demographic, right? When I hear that, I'm thinking Soul. I feel like that's black culture. Yeah. So who came up with the name? And then uh, you said the colors three times already, but I'm trying to figure out. <laughs> My head, like, all right, black and burgundy. Yeah. Why do we choose those two? <laughs> okay, so the name, I'll have to take credit for that one. Michael will tell you. It's so, okay. As well. I, I, I take credit for the name. Yeah. I came up with it. I mean, to be honest, again, I just, yeah, we, we were just trying to brain some of a few names and we kind of just felt like Soul Cap just had the feel, like you say, it's the feeling. Yeah. Right? It's like, it just feels right. It, it embodies what we're trying to do, essentially. So, um, so we went with Soul Cap and then the colours. So, what it was for us when we first started, again, we thought, cool, if if someone's going to wear a swimming... Like, I think people, a lot of people don't find swimming caps cool. Definitely not at the time. Like, swimming caps weren't cool. Do you know what I mean? And people wear them because they're a necessity and so on and so forth. And we were like, okay, if we're going to launch a swimming cap, we want it to feel premium. We want it to feel nice. We want it to kind of look stylish. We don't want to, like, put some brash, you know, crazy brand in you know, like with mad clip art, you know, right. uh, logos on it and stuff. Do you know what I mean? We wanted it to just yeah. like look clean, look nice. So, you know, we had, we we'd worked with, um, we worked to get the, the, the logo. We had the little branding. We were like, okay, cool. We just put the logo on it. Nice. Black, because to be honest with you, that's just safe. And I think, feel like people would buy black um, in terms of the colour of the swimming cap. And some of the research that we had done showing that black was actually like a, a, a good colour to go with. And then we knew we wanted to launch additional colours and other variations, but we thought burgundy was just like, it just felt premium. That was really <laughs> our feeling. Now, I, I, there's nothing really I could say on it, but it just felt premium. And people loved it. We dropped it and, and, and people loved it. And those were the two first colours we we, we, loved, we launched. And then after that, we also dropped um, a navy. And then we dropped like a kind of racing green. So it's like a, a deep blue and a deep green. Mm. And again, it's more just like a f- premium feeling. You know, I feel like if you go to a pool and you've got a bright, I don't know, pink hat and your hat is enormous, it, it just may draw attention to you and you may feel like, actually, I don't want it to just feel too brash and too in your face. Um, so that's why we launched them colours. Um, but then going speak, speaking further on that, actually, as time has gone on, um, you know, and our, our community's grown and more people know about the brand, we get people who swim outdoors and they're like, oh, we love your product. We love your brand, but your colours are too dark for outdoor swimming. We need, you know, if, if you're swimming on the out and outside, you need bright colours, essentially. Mm. So then we launched an outdoor range where we got the bright, the pinks, the yellows, like the, the bright reds and that kind of stuff. So, yeah. So, all right. When does it scale? So you start at 200, but eventually you, you get big enough to actually, you know, have a situation with the Olympics, which we'll talk about. But yeah. what happens in between then? What, what is the driving force to take you, you know, yeah. to success? So, so really, it was, it was mad. Like I said, I was obviously just nine to five come home at like 6 or 7 p.m. and I'm just on FaceTime to Michael to like 10 or 11 o'clock every night. So I'm sat in my living room on FaceTime. He's sat in his bedroom or living room on FaceTime. And um, what we found is, okay, cool. We we were getting some sales through. And early on, we didn't really have high expectations, but we just wanted to just keep pushing. So, you know, for example, trying to advertise. So putting a little bit of budget behind ads on, say, Amazon, for example. And then, cool, your product can start getting a better ranking. Amazon starts learning that people who are looking for large swimming caps are often buying your product. So then they push your, your product up the, up the listing, up the, um, up the ranking on the search term. Um, 
and then I think the issue that we found was that we didn't have enough money to, um, like the business wasn't making enough money to meet the demand. And that was like one of the early like challenges that we faced that, okay, cool, we've got these 150 and 50 caps and they're selling out. And if we need to place a new order, we need to place it now. Otherwise we're going to, we're going to sell out. Um, so luckily, because I was still in the nine to five and Michael had his bank job, we were like, cool, like, let's put some more money in. Let's just keep putting money in it, keep putting money in it. Um, to keep propping up the business, to make sure we can stay stocked. Um, so that was kind of how it started growing. And then, essentially, we, we we started just in the UK. But then we were like, actually, let's launch this in the US as well. So that was when we kind of launched in the US, where, again, like, obviously, the market is huge. It's like, on average, people say it's about five times the size of, um, of the UK market, say, on Amazon. So we launched on Amazon in the US as well. And then that was when things... Oh, there's a separate Amazon? yeah. So, okay, mm. so the Amazon, you started with just Amazon UK. Okay. Yeah, yeah. And then you went to Amazon US yeah. and, and same strategy. Same keyword. strategy. So you never, but how do you sell now? On your website or just do Amazon oh, From website, predominantly, yeah. So website, but. When did you transition to have enough traction to just start, you know, being a yeah. standalone brand? That was it, really. So I think, um, you know, I mean, you can still buy our products through Amazon now as well. Um, but we, we wanted to get to a kind of critical mass of the business. Um, we wanted to make sure like, you know, the business was self-sufficient. So now the business can pay for its own orders. If we're running low or if we need to like launch a new product and stuff, that new product strain, the, the business can, can, can manage that. Um, and then we had a website early on as well. But again, like I said, we weren't getting the traffic that Amazon was getting. Do you see mm-hmm. what I mean? We weren't getting the traffic. Google wasn't ranking us high. You know, if you searched <clears throat> long hair swimming cap, Amazon products were coming up. They were like the first link. So, that's, I think, one of the key things with, in my opinion, with e-com brands is like either you've got enough budget to try and market hard and, you know, heavy social media, all that kind of stuff. You know, early on, it was just us doing the social media. Um, so so we, we looked at Amazon, really, and because Amazon had the traffic, that's what helped push the business up. Mm. Um, and there are ways and means even with Amazon to, to, to put your brand across. So like, you know, making sure you're listing, obviously, the, the, the pictures, but then like telling the brand story within your within your listing you know people were like cool okay this is soul cap you know we get it um so then next time when people seen us say on instagram they were like yeah yeah, cool like, and, and i remember that brand i see them telling the brand story like in a bio like a bio yeah exactly so you can kind of like put i know sometimes you might see on amazon you scroll down you see the description and there's a bit more about the brand and stuff like that founders and stuff so yeah yeah so I, once you get to your yeah. own website now you're not having to pay a fee to Amazon because they're getting a percentage of every time, every yeah. sale. Yeah. So it makes sense. So are you going to make more profit to put it on your website? Exactly. But in the early stages, how did we come up with uh, pricing? Because that's key, right? Because yeah. there's a lot of competitors that sell these caps. Yeah. You actually, I'm assuming, have to use more material because these caps are yeah. a little bit larger. Yeah. So how did y'all determine pricing? So for us, really, it was kind of just we... we we wanted to do something like we wanted to have like a margin, which was reasonable, obviously to help the product, product, you know, grow and all that kind of stuff. But then at the same time, something that was reasonable for the customer, you know, we didn't want to, if we were the only credible choice for the product, we didn't want people to have to pay through the nose for it, essentially. So we kind of did a bit of research. We looked around at what some of the other long, long hair swimming caps were selling for. And we kind of just pitched it around there, to be honest. Um, like you say, we wanted to be competitive, but also we, need, we knew that we needed the margins to come through. And then, you know, making sure that you can you basically got a sustainable business model, really. So that was it. How much is your caps? Um, so you can get our caps for like, I don't know if I should say pounds or dollars. You can say pounds. We, <laughs> yeah. We're in London. Yeah. We can say both, actually, if, yeah. if you know you the them, numbers for both. You can get them for like 12 to like 18 pounds. Okay. Um, you know, sixteen dollars so to like, like 20. 18 dollars. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. That's about right. So around that, yeah. So, so what about like sales um, throughout the year, are, are there high seasons, slow seasons? Obviously, the summer, yeah. a lot of kids are going to the swimming pool. Yeah. But in the mm. colder months, those are specifically targeted for people who are competitive. Yeah. And like we said earlier, most of the people that we're trying to target yeah. aren't in competitive swimming. Exactly. So, what do you guys do in those parts of the year? Yeah, I think for us, you know, it's it's a funny one because actually December and January is usually quite busy because I feel like. New year, new me, like, okay, I'm trying something new. Yeah, yeah, personally new, <laughs> yeah. Learn, learn to swim, which yeah. is great, and, and, and we love it, and obviously we just always try and encourage it. Um, there's also a big movement for outdoor and wild swimming now in, in, in the UK, and I think also in the US. So I feel like the, the crazy seasonality, obviously summer's always going to be the big right. peak time, 
but I feel like it has leveled out a little bit where people are actually getting more interested in sort of outdoor wild swimming, swimming in the winter months um, and also the new year. So, um, yeah, I don't know. I think we just, I don't really know how we manage it, to be honest. But, um, you know, obviously for us as well, as a, as a swim brand, like we've been kind of making that move to um, just expand our product range as well, you know, expand our product offering and stuff. So It's called God's plan. <laughs> so, so have you done any marketing? Um paid marketing at all or uh in terms of like like Ads advertising or yeah 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 influencer so not really uh, not really so actually i'll tell you one what we did do you know again early relatively early in our journey we've probably been a couple of years in and we, we knew we were getting traction and we came across uh, a young lady called alice Deering, um and she uh was you know like a junior um swimming champion she won like a, sw- a junior swimming championship in the uk um and she was basically the only person of color who swam uh, for Great Britain, and at that to that point, there was uh, you know no woman of color who'd gone to the Olympics um, representing Team GB. Mm-hmm. Um, so we came across her story, and you know it was nuts because we were kind of just pushing off, and we started like marketing a bit more using social media, you know, put, trying to push our website a bit. And we came across her, and we and we reached out, and we were like, actually, do you know what? We want to try and support you on on your journey because what she was doing was you know so it aligned very well it was very synonymous with what we were doing so we kind of struck up a bit of a sponsorship type partnership type of arrangement where we could support her in the training and stuff for the olympics um and then you know she could also like rock our products and like you know talk about it and stuff so yeah because okay. yeah, in my brain like there's like a lot of especially in the states i don't know how it is out here but um one of our friends has like a, a festival called curl fest yeah yeah, yeah. you ever heard of it yeah yeah i've heard of it yeah um yeah. And it's like a whole movement of like yeah. natural hair. So I'm thinking maybe partnerships with something like that because that would be, you know, yeah. hand in hand. Because yeah, like yeah, it's yeah. about hair already. Exactly. So it's, an, it's a natural fit to be yeah. like, okay, now if you want to go swimming, this is the product that you should yeah. be using. Yeah, we have actually, we did, we did do like, um, there was a big festival, a hair care festival here called um, uh, Curly Treats as okay. well. And we, you know, we went to that and, you know, we, along, the, along the way we've done loads of things, reached out to people. We, you know, we, we, the influencer thing, we looked at it early on, but we were like, we can't really afford it. So, um, yeah, but it's been, it's just been organic, to be honest. And I feel like a lot of it has just spoke for itself because it's just the product, which I think was just needed. And given that we just came through and we put something incredible down, it was always going to, it was always going to work. So what, what happened with the Olympic situation? <laughs> yeah. So uh, with that, I mean, again, that was like, for us, it was, we, Okay, let me let me run it back actually. So we, we did a shoot. Right? We we invited some customers to come a photo through. shoot. A photo shoot. Yeah, we were gonna do a little photo shoot, and we invited some of our um, customers to come through and like we wanted to do like a parent child kind of shoot and stuff. Uh, and there was a woman who we who actually met us. Who came across us at that curly treats festival, and she had a daughter who's eight years old called Anaya, um, and Anaya was swimming for her local county uh, in in London, like London Borough of Newham, or something like. That. And she was like, oh, I, she bought the product for her daughter. And when we saw her at this photo shoot, she was like, I love my soul cap. I just love it. Like the swimming hat I had before just didn't work for me. Like my swimming lessons were disruptive. You know, the cap was always coming off. She had to get out of the pool to get someone to help her get her cap back on, all this. So <clears throat> when we, we spoke to her at that photo shoot, we were like, if she, if she wants to keep swimming and keep training and, and get competitive, and gets to a certain level, eventually there'll come a point where she has to use a competition-approved swimming cap, right? Um, and we were like, okay, cool. We, and we knew about, like, FINA. You had these, like, FINA-approved swimming FINA, caps. FINA, what's it? Uh, FINA is basically, like, the world governing body for swimming, okay. essentially, right? So they're, like, the Olympic, like, world body. They decide, you know, if you want to use, if you want to use, like, competitive, like, swimwear, goggles, that kind of stuff, yeah. your, your product, it has to be FINA-approved. Okay. For, for, they, for they, they started... Bringing them up when uh, Michael Phelps started breaking records. <laughs> yeah, like, yeah, yeah. Oh, what what technologies is he wearing that yeah. he's moving this fast? Yeah, you know, yeah, like, yeah. Everybody's just moving faster. Yeah, yeah, exactly. That's it. So we were like, okay, cool. So same way with the swimsuits, they have to get approved by the uh, you know c- committee. Swimming caps also have to be approved by the committee. So we were like, okay, cool. This young girl wants to keep using our product, but then she gets to a certain level where they say, okay, sorry, that that product's not approved. So you can't use it. Um, then, then she would have to choose between that sport that she loves and like you know her hair or the cap that has worked for her. Mm-hmm. So we were like, actually, no, we, she shouldn't have to make that choice. 
let's just apply it and let's get our caps approved. So um, me and Michael, like, we're re- really like methodical characters. Um, so we went online, we looked at the FINA website, we looked at all the criteria um, for swimming caps to be approved. And we, we looked at him like, oh, that's fine. Like, our caps meet all the criteria. Um, and so we were like, cool, let's just apply for the caps to be approved, like business as usual. We didn't really think anything of it. We didn't even think it was going to get, we just thought it was going to go through, pay the fee, call, approve, keep it moving. Um, and then obviously the initial uh, uh, response we had was that, you know, the, the, the swimming caps you know, were not going to be considered or were not approved for use um, for, for the Olympics. So we were like, okay, that's kind of weird. Like, what's, <laughs> what's the reason, you know? And, and I think the reason said, yeah, like it doesn't, the cap doesn't, um, meet the natural form of the head. So that was the quote. Yeah. Literally the quote from Vina yeah. it did not match the natural form of the head. Yeah. So, and then, <laughs> and do you know what's nuts actually? Do you know what's mad? When, because I, because we saw the, all the criteria. So that was one of the criteria, you know, one of the criteria is about the thickness, like yeah. the material, all this kind of stuff. And when I saw the, 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 that the cap has to meet the natural form of the head, my interpretation was that, you know, you get like decorative swimming caps for like children or like shark fins and stuff yeah. like that. That was my interpretation. So I was thinking, oh, that's cool. Like, we don't have shark fins. We haven't got anything crazy. Like, you know, it's just like a swimming cap. Yeah, when we saw um, the natural form of the head criteria, we thought that it meant, okay, if your swimming cap has like shark fins, anything like that, that it wasn't going to be approved. Obviously, our caps don't have that. Um, so then we went back to them and we said, you know, we, we, I think my feeling initially was just that they've probably only ever get... Uh, applications from the big brands the nikes adidas head arena like all the big guys and they've heard like some some brand called soul cap coming through trying to apply so they probably just thought like just snub it or whatever um that's that was my initial feeling and then so i went back and we said you know how can we appeal the decision how can we kind of just appeal that uh process maybe have a conversation explain to you what we're doing um and they basically come back and they said okay cool you can't appeal because the application hasn't gone in front of the panel, approval panel. We're not actually going to even put that application forward because, you know, we don't basically, like, to, it, to me, it felt like they were just like, we don't want it. Like, so, mm. so we couldn't appeal and they wouldn't approve it. So our hands were tied. We couldn't do anything. Do you get me? Like, what do you do in that, in that situation? <laughs> you can't appeal it. They're saying you can't, you can't run. So, okay, cool. So then that was when basically, you know, obviously then eventually, like, the story got out. <clears throat> um... And yeah, everyone had an uproar and we were overwhelmed. Like we didn't even anticipate. So how did it get out? How did the story get out? So we had, um, we had spoken to like a few kind of like journalists and stuff. And we were kind of just saying, you know, people would like women's health had reached out to us from before to, to, to do an interview with us. Like uh, we were, you know, featured on like the independent, like we've been featured and we're getting a bit of press, press attraction. And then, um, and then when this thing happened, like, uh, our brand manager like had a few contacts and she was just talking to this person. They were like, nah, like we need to, we need to get this story out. Like it's, it's, it's nuts. So, um, and we just thought, okay, cool. Like, you know, just run it. And it went nuts, man. We, we didn't anticipate the level of like people were just on, onto it, you know, yeah. and everyone was writing for us. And that's what like, we really appreciate the fact that people actually like wrote out for us and people said, nah, like this ain't right. Cause we didn't think it was right. Mm-hmm. You know? And sometimes I think when you're in, when you're in that situation, you can't tell whether maybe you're just like in too deep to, to, to see, you know, to, to see it. But I think with, with the reaction that kind of story got, yeah. it felt like, yeah, no, it was completely, it was completely justified. So FINA after, this is like July, this is the, this yeah. is the Tokyo Games. Yeah. They later, they apologized. They apologized, guys. yeah. But did they lift the ban? No. No. So essentially, because we still hadn't gone through that approval process, mm-hmm. we weren't approved for use, essentially. Okay. So... I know the media kind of run the word ban and all that kind of stuff, but really, you know, the, the, the real facts of the matter was that they weren't allowed to be used because they hadn't been, they weren't approved. Okay. Do you hear me? Yeah. So they have to be approved for use to go through. But obviously, like, you know, it's like the reporters, like, yeah, they, you know, ban and stuff. Like, that's what sells. Yeah. That's what sells, exactly. Yeah. So well, we never actually said our cats were banned. Yeah. Um, we just said, you know, they, they weren't approved. Um, or they wouldn't be approved. And they, weren't, they wouldn't be considered. Um, but then, yeah, so... So then everyone went nuts. Obviously, I was on the phone with Brent uh, Nowicki, who is like you know, the chief CEO of, of FINA. You know, I was on a phone call with um, uh, the, the, the you know, CEO of British Swimming, 
you know, we're all, uh, the Blacks Women Association jumped on this call and we were all on there and, and they were like, yo, Brent, Brent said, you know, to be honest with you, I'm sorry. Like, he, he'd actually had come in um, after. So he was, he was actually new. So he'd come in after this decision was made and he saw the stuff blowing up about Soul Cat and he was like, what's Soul Cat? You know, who's Soul Cat? What's going on? And he said he looked at the file and it wasn't clear to him why the application wasn't put forward. He was like, to be honest with you, it wasn't clear to, to me why it didn't get put forward. And, you know, I can only apologise for, for, for what happened. And, you know, to be fair, it was quite supportive. He was like, you know, we, we can work together. We can help you guys. Like, let's look at the situation. Let's see if we can get it approved. And currently we are actually going through oh, um, the process. The, the, the process. Okay. So, that, so how about that? That was my next question. Like, where does it stand right now? Though? Yeah. So as it stands now, I mean, we're waiting, I mean, We've been waiting for a little while, but yeah. uh, I keep pushing them. Hopefully, I think we should get a response. Um, hopefully, in the next next couple of it's months, three more years to the next Olympics, or two more years to the next Summer Olympics. Yeah, so, so we've got time. But then we've got the Commonwealth Games. There's other yeah, things world, going on. World so. Games and all that. Yeah, exactly. So. Yeah, and, yeah. I mean, I read the. I mean, based on it, right? All the silk, the the, the caps of silicone. They actually said that because you use more material, it actually might be a disadvantage for swimmers. That's the thing. <laughs> like, we just wanted people to have the option. Yeah. You see what I'm saying? Yeah. We weren't saying that, yo, like. Everyone's gonna go and buy a soul cap and use that at the Olympics. Right. That wasn't what we were saying. But what we what we were saying is actually we wanted people, if you're a competitive swimmer, we wanted you to have the option. You know? To have it, yeah. Rather than you say, okay, cool, well, that's it. I either just quit swimming or I have to like just completely like forego my hair or anything like that. So we kind of wanted people as they were progressing through them competitive ranks, as they were getting to them levels. To have the option, and it, it makes sense, right? Like I've been like, if you watch swimming, you watch the Olympics, yeah, you you start to notice that like most swimmers and divers, they're wearing two caps, yeah. So I'm thinking like, yo, if they're wearing two caps, obviously there's a size issue, yeah, and obviously there's a issue with not keeping whatever your hair dry, yeah, yeah. So yeah. there's there's <laughs> I mean that's the thing. There's so many there's so many things, and it runs deep. Like it does run deep when you sort of start going into it and stuff. Um, you know, I think probably I imagine the culture maybe if you were to speak to most super competitive swimmers the culture probably is you like you sacrifice whatever for, to, to do like you cut your hair you cut your hair <laughs> yeah. you know that's the, that's what's expected you have to cut your hair if you want to get to this level you have to cut your hair but i feel like still there may be points along the way you know alice Deering had said herself to me that she always she, so regularly she would say ah oh, like i feel like i've you know got to sacrifice my hair do i keep want to keep doing it blah 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 and you can imagine for like a young you know, a young person, especially when you just don't really see that many black people swimming, you know, potential future Olympic greats out there who just don't think the sport's for them. So how how big can the, like, what's the largest size that you have? Uh, our largest size is a double XL. Um, so if you've got dreadlocks, dreadlocks. You've got, if you've got dreadlocks down to your back, like full on, like big. Like a fit dreadlock to your yeah. back, yeah? Yeah. Wow. Yeah, it's okay. big, man, they, and they're stretchy, and yeah, they're big. So what's the scaling model? Like, what's, your, what's the plans to actually take this to the point where it's moving millions of units a year? Like, mm. what do you, what's, your, what's your plan, yeah. what's your vision? Yeah, so for us, to be honest with you, what, what we think is we see ourselves as a swimming brand for everyone. Um, you know, throughout our journey, we've always kind of wanted to support the community, you know, give money back, run like initiatives to get people you know at grassroots level into swimming working with you know we've got cool guys like tank proof in the u.s who they offer free swimming lessons for children in disadvantaged areas you know we've worked with swim them crew in london um so so we always we always want to give back and we want to keep that community feel make sure that we're always giving back to the community um but we want to be the best swim brand in the world to be honest with you man so um you know obviously like now i've got our own com you know soulcap.com website mm-hmm. um you know we'll expanded our product range so we've got you know swimming goggles are landing very soon we've got merch as you can see towels we've got we got a head we've got the hair towels we've got body towels goggles coming. swimming goggles are landing um we've got training aids as well so like pool boys and kickboards you know um what about the suits swimsuits sw- yeah well that's the swimwear is is the is the is the thing that's actually we're working on as well okay. which we think is going to be our big ticket and for us as well the swimwear we just want it to be like inclusive yeah. we want it to work you know work for everyone we're gonna you know we're, we're going like plus size on the women plus size on the men we're gonna have the small stuff we're gonna have kids stuff and we're just really looking to expand and, and scale um but again to be honest it's all fully 
funded by ourselves, you know. Yeah. We haven't got to that. We've not we've not sat there and said, all right, cool, let's let's bring in some some external capital, let's bring in some equity to help scale things. So that's why it has to be managed at the same time, you know. So oh. after after the uh the ordeal with FINA, how was the the, the business, right? Did we did we see a, a obviously an increase in yeah. sales? Yeah. And were you guys prepared for that at the time? No, we weren't at all. We weren't <laughs> at all, to be honest with you. If we knew how big that story would have got, we would have made sure we were way more prepared. Mm. Um, we weren't. We were, like, you know, we, we, we were selling out. Like, as fast as we could get this stuff in, it was going out. Um, and, you know, to be fair, even for us, we realized our back, our back office operations weren't good enough because we couldn't meet that demand. You know, uh, people, some people had bought caps and they had to wait like, you know, a few weeks before they were getting their orders and stuff. And for us, that, you know, that's not good enough. Um, so we were telling people, yo, like, you know, if, if you have any issues, reach us, you know, people's stuff was getting lost in the post. It was all mad, you know. Um, so now, obviously, we're making sure that back-end processes are proper. We've got good partners, making sure that we can stay stocked, you know, keep everything in place to just essentially promote that growth, yeah. Has the, has the supply chain, like you get manufactured like China? Yeah. Has the supply chain issue affected you? Yeah, it has. We had to, we've had a few moments, to be fair, man. Apparently, like, the price of raw silicon was going, going through the roof. Mm. <laughs> so that was, like, obviously a big one. But, <laughs> you know, when we have things like that, we make sure we don't want to try and... We don't want to pass that cost on to the customer if we, if we don't have to. So we, we just absorb them kind of things, you know. But that's why I think now if we diversify our product range, then hopefully, you know we're not going to be so reliant on just, just the swimming caps. Um, and to be honest, we've seen that already, man. People are going on the website and they're buying, like, the hair towel. And the hair towel is crazy. For anyone who looks out, anyone who's into hair care, anything like that, if you want, get a, get a soul cap hair towel, trust me. What's a hair towel? It's, it's a microfiber hair towel. Yeah. But it's, like, different, different, different level. That's good for the pool and a shower. Yeah, trust me, different <laughs> level. Any Any... Any, like, women who are into that hair care type stuff, if they swim when they do have their hair, yeah. hair care, wash day, use our hair towel. Trust me, it's crazy. Yeah. Before, I mean, that's, like I said, that's, that's great if you're swimming or even if you're not swimming. Yeah, yeah. Because most times when women get their hair done or prior to getting their hair done, they wash their hair. Yeah, yeah. And before they blow dry it, yeah. they have the hair towel. Yeah, 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 exactly. So, Just yeah, like, I, got, I got something. <laughs> your, your goal to be like the Seiko. Uh, yeah, man. I think for us, we just want to be... We just want to be like a swimming brand for everyone. We want to be the go-to where, for example, you know, people who have previously felt excluded from the sport can say, actually, no, Soul Cup is a brand that will represent us. They rep us. Do you know what I'm saying? Um, so let me ask you this. How has COVID, did COVID affect? The- yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. COVID. Couldn't, couldn't get product. Yeah, couldn't get product. Pools were closed. And pools were closed also. Yeah, it was hard, man. It was tough. That's tough. But- what are you gonna do? Do you know what I mean? So you just you just we just had to just write out. Yeah, yeah, we, yeah. We went into we, when that happened. We went into defense mode. So we were like, for example, if we had uh, plans to launch new products, uh, you know, to start d- developing, you know, for example, a new website, all this kind of stuff. All that stuff just was on the back burner. You know, ad spend, for example. So if you're spending on ads and stuff like that, we had to scale it all back um, because because we knew that you know cash was cash was was going to be king at that point. So what's, what's your biggest market? UK or America? Um, I think it's about, it's probably about 50% US, maybe like 40% UK, and then about 10% the rest of the world. Yeah. So, and, and we get orders from everywhere. It's nuts. We get order from like, orders from all over the world. And it's, well, you know. Just, so, I mean, swim, like, this is, this is, a, this is a big business. Um, so, you guys are kind of like the little fish coming into this business at yeah. the time. Are there any sharks out there that are saying, you know what? We want to acquire you. Is that has that happened to you guys yet? Um, we have had we have had some kind of people approach us in terms of like um, these are more like aggregator type companies. So you can get these companies that um, buy up brands that do well on Amazon and stuff like that. So a few of them uh. have hit us up and they've been trying to hit us to for acquisition. Um, we've had um, I don't know if you guys have heard of Dragons Den. It's, it's like it's a bit like hard. Uh, uh, sorry, no, 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 no. It's it's like a. Have you? Is there, there's a TV show called like Shark uh, Tank. Shark Tank. Yeah. Oh. It's like the UK equivalent of that, and they've been on to us, man. They've been hitting us low, saying, oh, "I'll come through." Like you know, wanting wanting us to go forward for the application uh, process. That, that, but, uh, yeah, I can see it. I can see that. But yeah, I don't know, man. For us, we just feel like okay, cool. Let's keep doing our thing. Let's keep pushing. Yeah. Um. You know, we've we've had emails. People just emailing us saying, "Do you guys looking for you know investment and uh, stuff like that?" Um. 
people asking like, where can we buy your stock? <laughs> Obviously, we're not listed on, on any stock market. But so yeah, your um, anti-investment, right? No, now. no, no, not 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 anti. Definitely not. I think we just need to make sure the timing's right. As, as that we can get. Yeah, I mean, with me and Michael, we want to get the push the value of the business as much as we can before we then start looking for um, that outside capital. And I think we're we're close to that point now. You know, like things like product range is like relatively low hanging fruit. Like we know how to launch sick products. Do you know what I mean? We know how to put together like great products and, and market them and put them out nicely. So we're thinking, cool, let's do what we're good at. And then when we get to that level where, okay, cool, we can start getting other people in, getting other people's expertise and stuff. Um, Crowdcube is another one who've reached out to us. Is it Crowdcube? One of them kind of, you know, the websites where you can pop up a, like a campaign and then people can subscribe and, 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 mm. um, and buy some shares in your company and stuff. Like um, crowd, crowdfunding. Yeah, like basically crowdfunding. Yeah, yeah. I think the, it's the, the company that hit us, maybe it was Crowdcube, but yeah, like crowdfunding. And that's something that as well we thought, for because it's a kind of community-based brand, that that could be also a potentially good option as well. Um, but yeah, so I think there's definitely exciting things to come. Yeah, Yeah. so you, you obviously it's you and Michael. Yeah. But who, who else is part of the team to make sure that the execution is at its highest? Because even when you, you were talking about the deliveries, you said that's not good enough. Yeah. And so obviously it can't just be you two. So like who, yeah. who else? And yeah. when did you decide that we need to get these specific people to help us scale? Yeah. So, I mean, it was just me and Michael for quite a while, to be honest. Um, uh, my, my fiance, um, my now fiance, she's like worked in like fashion and stuff. So she's helped us massively with like on the photo shoot sides you know, making sure actually like the product looks really good. I thought you did it. <laughs> oh yeah, I doesn't say I did the first one and it was it was joking, it was joking. bad. It was really bad. Smart so, man, get a so, good woman. Yeah, so, so, so exactly. So so she's helped. Um, then we were like, cool, let's get a brand manager in. So we found a brand manager um, who who was, was sick. Like she she got the brand really well and she helped like us push it. And then outside of that, it's just loads of freelancers to be honest. So wherever like you know we've got people who we can lean on for like copywriting. We've got people we can lean on. Who are specialists in like PPC advertising and um, you know Google ads and that kind of stuff. You know we, we lean out to designers when we need you know design work done and on packaging and that kind of stuff. So that's it's really lean. It's, it's a lean team. Pretty much we got me, Michael, brand manager, um, and like we've we there's like a government scheme now as well where you can get uh, people in who are like you know young people who want experience and stuff. So we've leaned on a, a guy like who's we want to keep on now. He's a content creator. Um, and he does video and he's really good. For like social media? Yeah, just like some social stuff. Um, TikTok? And we, we've not really ventured into TikTok, but Jax was telling me about, he said his TikTok's booming these days. So TikTok's like, the wave. Stuff like that, yeah. TikTok's the it. wave, definitely got to get on TikTok. Yeah, yeah. So what's the goal? Like, when do you do this full time? Like, have you thought about that? Like, you have a number that you need to hit before you was like, all right, I need, this has to be doing this month, this much in revenue for me to leave the actuary world. And just you know what? Month. I haven't got a number, to be honest. Like, I think for me, the reason why I didn't make that leap and I could have done, but the reason why I decided not to is because I just felt like it puts more pressure on the business unnecessarily. Um, I think as long as I'm able to, you know, fulfill my kind of duties in my nine to five and also assist on the, on the business, I, I will. Because I feel like, okay, cool. If, I, if we could hire, you know, another person who's great at, whatever or we, it means we could accept like accelerate the launch of our goggles or our website then we should be doing those things rather than me coming in and say cool like i, I got a mortgage to pay and i got a kid now and mm-hmm. it, do you see what i'm saying mm-hmm. um, so so that was kind of the the approach um that i've taken to it to be honest and michael's full-time so michael's been full-time okay so michael's full-time in the business obviously we've got an office now as well so we've got people in there all the time and then i'm just coming through like you know it's good it's good to know um for people to hear because a lot of times people think that you can't do both or yeah. you have to like, and, and like you said, you know, it puts a lot of pressure not only on the business but on you personally yeah. too. Like, you know, if you, you know, just relying on just the business to make money for you, for you to survive and live, then you might do things that you might not want to do. Yeah. But if you got that cushion of having, you know, just a job also, yeah, it takes less pressure off. Yeah, exactly. Um, so, you know, it's one of these things a lot of times people are scared to become entrepreneurs but, Tell people all the time, you can definitely do both. You yeah. don't necessarily have to just jump out the window and quit your job. You can manage both. Yeah, prime exactly. example. I'm a prime example of that. And I started looking at it like the school, my school district was my investor. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Until I could own my own company. Yes. 
And so when you, you start thinking like that, it's like, yeah, you get paid every two weeks, but every two weeks is an investment. It's an investment. It's just a mindset thing. That's it. Yeah. And, I, and I feel like for me personally as well, my feeling is that, you know, if obviously Michael was full time and I'm, we make sure that, okay, all the <clears throat> perks I get in my nine to five. So, you know, salary, pension, health cover, all that kind of stuff. We make, I'm, we make sure Michael's getting that on from the business as well. Mm-hmm. Do you get me? Um, and I think that's, that's the beauty of it. And if things were to go left and if, you know, things were to, you know, I don't know, not work out, I, they, they won't touch words but um <laughs> but you know then at least even between us i could say yeah yeah okay cool this this i still got a job here and i can help support until he's you know was, would be at a point do you get me yeah um uh where, where he's back on his feet or whatever but and that's not gonna happen like trust me he's a beast man i'm so i'm sad he couldn't be here today but he's a beast yeah right? it's, it's, it's all good so what's the percentage of the products that you sell on amazon versus a website um i'd probably say now like we recently launched a new website recently um and we were on squarespace before uh using the squarespace platform which like it you know it's not built for commerce like that so we've moved over to shopify now um, we use shopify yeah we use shopify and like it's, it's it's you know it's taking things to the next level um and so i'd probably say it's probably around maybe like 30 percent, 40 percent amazon and the rest on the website um so which obviously you know i'm happy if it means a customer can get a product quicker from Amazon, do it. Um, that, that's fine. So long as the, the customer is happy, the customer can get the product. You know, Amazon is really good in that in from that regard. If we wanted to launch in a new market, say for example, Amazon, you know, they've set up Amazon Australia now, and for us to get either you, you, you get this kind of weird spot when you're in e-commerce. So it's like you either get like a fulfillment center like a warehouse or something in the country or like in the region which you want to be in um but you have to kind of be doing enough getting enough traction there already to do that so if we wanted to sell to someone to australia cool they can buy it direct from our website um now and they might just have to wait because it will come from london probably um or if we're set up on amazon you uh, australia we can just send our product into the um, into the warehouses there and people have got like next day access to our products that. So I was gonna ask you. So your products, where are your products kept now? You know, you in your warehouse. Yeah, yeah. So we've a got a third party warehouse, or you got your own. So yeah. So in London, we've got in our office, we've got an office, uh, a studio, like a photography studio as well, and um, storage in that unit. So we we hold a lot of stuff there. Then we also hold stock in Amazon UK, Europe, and US. To the Am- and that's and, like and Amazon Center. Yeah. So we've got Amazon fulfillment centers, but we also got third party a third party logistics company as well. So you do like three different types of stuff. Yeah, so so what we'll do typically is like we'll say, you know, with Amazon now as well, they, they can be a bit funny with like lim- inventory limits, like how much you can store in their in their warehouses and stuff. So we might send our product to our third party partner in the USA, and then cool when if we're, we think we're running down on a bit, we'll get them to ship a few boxes over to Amazon, um, and then Amazon will fulfill the orders to the customer. You you said earlier that you. Um have community givebacks, yeah, and partnerships with I'm, I'm assuming community centers, yeah, yeah. It, it's part of that um, the giveaway of the caps because I could see, especially schools where it's predominantly black or yeah. women or, or men of color, having that as the official cap of the team or the school. And now you have contracts with school districts, yeah, universities, yeah, yeah. and eventually, like I could see countries. Yeah. Right, where you're the official yeah, yeah. brand of the country. Definitely. That's that's the hope and that's the plan, to be honest. Already, like, there are swimming clubs, just like small clubs mm-hmm. or, or, like, you know, affiliates where we'll just give them the caps for free and just say, yeah, like, you know, do, do your thing, like, you know, give them to people who need them and stuff. Um, you know, obviously, like, financial donations as well, where we can we'll donate to, to some of these kind of non-profit organisations to help push what they're doing. And it just builds the community, builds the, you know, builds the brand. Um, and I feel like, we feel it's our duty to not just sit there and say we're an inclusive brand and we're for everyone, but then we're not actually putting our money where our mouth is and actually like backing that and supporting it. So, yeah. Interesting. Yeah. So I just had one last question about this fulfillment. Uh, so can you just explain that to me again? So you have a fulfillment center yeah. in America, yeah. but they're not actually sending the product. They're just actually, when the order gets made, it gets to the fulfillment center and then the fulfillment center sends it to Amazon. Uh, so yeah, so basically, sorry, what, what I meant was, okay, if we've got like a, a logistic company in America, mm-hmm. so if we get an order for our website, say, for example, 
then they could fulfill that order direct to the customer. Directly, yeah, yeah, right. But then obviously, if we were like, okay, cool, we need to get products to Amazon because we're running low. The, they, they, the have, they, have taking, enough, they have enough product no, where they can send it they, to Amazon. Yeah, exactly. So we'll have a setup where so they you, might be able to just okay. send a box over but, to, to plug the gap and stuff so you like just that. So you just buy in bulk. Yeah. So buy like, you know, 3,000 caps. I mean, yeah. I, I think last year, We'd ordered like 52,000 caps. 52,000 caps. For example. You keep some in UK, in yeah. your spot, that you can send out yourself in the yeah, UK. Yeah. Some in America for the American customers. And then you send Amazon whenever they need it. Yeah, exactly. You just check the numbers to see you yeah. run, you're running low. It's essentially. But that's, I mean, that's one of the hardest parts as well of managing the business. Running the logistics. The logistics. Who does that? Act. Michael predominantly does that. He's, he's the guy. But to be honest with you, man, that's, you know, I, I've been speaking to other e com guys, um, you know, that, that I've met just through like communities and stuff. And everyone seems to be having the same issue where it's like, cool, getting the stock in and getting it back out is, 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 is such a challenge for everyone. And when you've got, we've got eight different colors now across, you know, five different sizes. And now we've got a bunch of other products. And it's it's a bit of a juggling act. Managing everything. Yeah, managing. You're running low here. You, yeah, yeah. This yeah. isn't selling. Yeah, yeah. Let's cut this yeah, down. Yeah. Exactly. We're not so. putting that line pink out anymore. <laughs> that stuff that nobody thinks about. Yeah. Even with us, like for our merch, it's like, all right, the t shirts always do good. A hoodie might do good, but one color might not do good. The yeah. crew neck might not. So you got to know because you don't want to just have a bunch of random stuff that's not selling. Exactly. Then you got to do flash sales to try to get rid of it. <laughs> yeah. You do Black Friday sales? We haven't yet. We you haven't yet. But I think next year is going to be our probably be our, oh sorry this year even will be our first proper Black Friday. I think yeah we've never done one. We never really do like I've done like flash sales or anything like that. But I think it's it's probably something that we will yeah look to do. You have a high ticket cost item? Um, high cost item. Well, I think when we hit the swimwear. That would probably be, yeah. that would probably it's be. Like, like bathing suits? Bathing suits yeah, yeah, like bathing suits. Those are pricey. Um, you know, looking at kind of like, yeah, things like wetsuits and stuff. You can't really get, people struggle with getting wetsuits for bigger sizes and stuff. It's true. You know, um, the merch is like, we, we want to do everything nice. So like, this is like organic cotton, you know, want to do nice stuff. So uh, the price points, they're not crazy, like for what we have to pay for them. But, you know, it's probably a higher price point um, for, for uh, you know, in general. But for what it is, it's not crazy compared to... Yeah. You know I mean? Nah, man, it's dope, man. <laughs> yeah. I appreciate you taking the time to come sit with us. I appreciate you guys. Everybody go support. How can they um, purchase? Talk about the social media, the website, all of that stuff. Yeah, exactly. So the social media is Soulcap Official. Um, the website is soulcap.com. Um, and, you know, yeah, you can go through there. Those, that's where you can get the product. So check out our stuff, check out our socials. Yeah, appreciate that. Support the black entrepreneurs. You, you might have solved a problem in my household. So I the, that. How was the vibe with the with black entrepreneurship community in, in the UK and London? It's great. It's great, I think. Like, to be honest with you, I'm, like I said, I've recently just had a kid, so I'm not like oh, out. I'm not, yeah, yeah. Thank you, yeah. I'm not like out and active and that kind of stuff. So, um, and like with the nine to five and the business, like obviously I'm, I'm not busy. But for me, like I always just want to connect with people. I always, if, if, if I see people who have got, businesses who are doing stuff I'll always be like yeah cool let me support share buy their product do you know what I'm saying I always want to support um, you know other not even just black man any entre- entrepreneurs where people are trying to do stuff people are trying to do good things as well like definitely always want to support that so yeah nice vibes Troy housekeeper item yeah man shout out to everybody across the world all our earners everywhere man we are indebted to you man. y'all have spread the word y'all told a friend to tell a friend that's why we're able to do things like this, come to the UK, go to Lagos, Nigeria, Egypt, Jamaica. Uh, it's because of all the support that y'all been giving us. So shout out to y'all. And, and shout out to SoulCat. I, I will definitely be getting a few. Um, uh, keep rocking with a shout out to everybody that's uh, purchased all our merch. Obviously, we spoke about it here. Um, so yeah, man, love is love. Yeah, shout out to my guy Jax again. Shout out to Tape London for, for facilitating us in yeah. the hospitality. Right. And shout out to LaArc. We can shout them out. Yeah, shout, shout out to Paris. LaArc in Paris. Yeah. Uh, thank you guys for rocking with us. We'll see you next week. Peace. Peace. My graduates from my school being Forbes. Backdrop. Backdrop. <laughs> a mic drop. Backdrop. Backdrop. <laughs>